Greetings, friends around the world. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel. Are you a procrastinator? Do you put off things that you know you should be doing? One of the things that comes up on my computer is something called Pocket. It recommended a particular article. I'd like to read some things about this article as well as scriptures. If you're a Christian, you might find these helpful. The article is titled, How to Beat Procrastination. The Roman era Stoic philosopher Seneca once joked that the one thing fools all have in common is they're always getting ready to live, but never actually do. With any goal, our imaginations often run wild, envisioning all the things that can go wrong. A life is built action by action, or Christian life, building character day by day. I want to read some scriptures about procrastinators. For example, from the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to be reading from the uh, New King James Version pretty much all the time, I think. Proverbs 13, verse 4 says, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. So the lazy man, oh, I want to have this, I want to have that, but you know, I'm really not willing to work hard, do extra, but do two jobs maybe, I'll go to work in school, uh, etc., etc. Here's another one from Proverbs. Proverbs 22, verse 13. The lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I, I shall be slain in the streets. It's too dangerous. Maybe I'll get COVID. Maybe something else will happen. I just can't go to work. Now, obviously, you don't want to intentionally put yourself in unnecessary danger. But people come up with all kinds of excuses. And they've been doing this for thousands of years. Or God would not have inspired Solomon to write this or say this. Now let's go to Proverbs 20, verse 4. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. Uh, the weather's just not quite right. It's too cold. The Bible says you're still supposed to be working. Now let's go to Ecclesiastes 4 and read verse 5. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. They just aren't doing enough. They're not taking steps that they should. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of James. James chapter 2, starting at verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them of the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Having good intentions is not enough. Christians need to take proper actions. Now going back to that pocket recommended article, it had this next section, other section, create a routine. In a world where so much is out of our control, committing to a routine we do control as a way of establishing and reminding ourselves of our own power. Without a disciplined schedule, procrastination inevitably moves in with all the chaos, complacency, and confusion. What was I going to do? What do I wear? What shall I eat? What shall I do first? Well, I'll get to that last question in a moment, but it's, we want to be under God's control. But as far as that last question, Jesus did address this in Matthew chapter 6. So you might want to go there. I'm going to start with verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What will you eat? What will you drink? Nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is life not more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to its stature? Its stature. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first 
the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now as far as getting into a routine, the Bible talks about that as well. For example, we'll go to Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you will do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So we see a weekly schedule. A schedule where you're supposed to work six days and not on the seventh, which makes you happy to plan and to be diligent. You know, put it off. In addition to that, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, there's an annual schedule as well. It says, The feast of the Lord, which you proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And it starts off talking about the Sabbath, etc., but it talks about the biblical holy days, which come every year. So it's another part of the routine that God expects you to do. Now, getting back to the pocket article, got another section. Use a counterforce. When a bad habit reveals itself, counteract it with a commitment to a contrary virtue. Oppose established habits. Use the counterforce of training to get traction and make progress and to channel the negative impulse into something, anything positive. Well, one counterforce is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. Another is to realize that you're supposed to actually do good. We've got a book called The Mystery of God's Plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? And the section of it talks about doing good. God is good and does what's right. God also wants us to do good as it pleases Him. Now, Jeremiah 32, verse 19. You are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his way and according to the fruit of his doings. Galatians 6, 9, 10. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are the household of faith. Romans 2, 5. God, who will render to each according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient con- countenance, continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. God wants good for you if you truly love and obey Him. Now, Ecclesiastes 3, sorry, verse 12. Nothing is better for man that he should eat and drink, and his soul shall be enjoy as good of his labor. This I saw was from the hand of God. Sorry, that's Ecclesiastes 2, 24. Now Ecclesiastes 3. I know nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. Every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It's the gift of God. I know whatever God does, it shall be forever. And this is true. Productive work helps with that. Getting back to that pocket article, it says, get a small win every day. One gain per day. That's it. It's a way to curb, curbing our procrastinating tendencies. Remembering that incremental, consistent, humble, persistent work is the way to improvement. Now, that's not quite the way Jesus put it, nor are we supposed to limit success. But we are to be humble. Plus, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, having success every day is something we should strive to do. And not just, oh, I'll get to it eventually. No, every day we should make progress. But getting back to that article, it also said, Free yourself from the inessential. So much of what we think we must do, or what we end up doing, is not essential. Rip off the chains of obligations to these things, then you'll be able to better do what is essential. And, you know, Jesus dealt with this in uh, Matthew 6, but he also dealt with it in a different way in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 41. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried 
in trouble about many things. But one thing is needed. Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So Mary and Martha had different priorities and Jesus is saying, look, there's some things more important than uh, day-to-day routine. Now that pocket article also had this other subheadline: face your important tasks head on. The Bible teaches, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there's no work nor device or knowledge or wisdom to the grave where you're going. Your physical life and this society, this world society, is not going to last. It's going to be replaced by the kingdom of God. Don't you really want to be part of that? Procrastination can derail Christians. I'm going to read a fair amount from the uh, old Worldwide Church of God uh, uh, on this subject. It was uh, an article called uh, Overcome Procrastination from the Good News Magazine of May of 1983. Do you put off things that need to be done? You need to know the causes and some practical, effective solutions for this problem. You're probably familiar with procrastination. All of us fall into it, and fairly easily from time to time. And the effects can be devastating. You can be robbed of happiness and peace of mind, harm your relationships with others, and yes, even keep yourself out of God's kingdom. Does that last statement sound shocking? It shouldn't. Procrastination, putting things off, can be a deadly, sinister enemy. How? Christ's parable about the ten virgins addresses this problem. All the virgins wanted to meet the bridegroom, but only five were wise. Those neglected to bring along a supply of oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, for their lamps. They had procrastinated by placing more importance on some other thing else. As a result, they were not allowed to be part of the marriage. What lesson does this parable have for you? Simply state, if you put off your preparation now for the kingdom, you will not qualify for eternal life. In the parable of the talents, fear prevented a man from developing his talents. Even entire groups of people can let fear paralyze them. Remember what happened to Israel in the wilderness? They received a glowing report about the land that flowed with milk and honey, but they were afraid to face the land's inhabitants, who were said to be giants. And their fears grew. As their fears grew, their faith weakened and led to rebellion against God's will in 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Just as a man with one talent in the nation of Israel were denied blessings, so could you lose blessings and even be kept out of God's kingdom. Replace fear with faith. Remarkable accomplishments can result. Love can also help conquer effects of fear. Apply this teaching. Applying this teaching can help you overcome the negative effects of fear because you love to do something, namely obey God, your love to do something, namely to obey God, is greater than your fear of attempting it. Act now. Now that you've considered these, these barriers, what's your reaction? Have you seen some attitudes that are keeping you from doing God's will? Are you convicted of the need to stop procrastinating? Are you now ready to change? Eliminating procrastination will bring many blessings. Instead of frustration, anger, and guilt, you'll experience peace of mind, a product of doing what is right. Your productivity will increase. And so will your blessings from God. Beyond these temporal blessings is even greater blessing, eternal life. Listen to Jesus Christ from Matthew 24, 45 to 47. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing, not waiting till later. Assuredly, I say to you, he'll make him ruler over his goods. God has given each of us responsibilities. He expects us to be doing them now. Do not, don't risk your eternal life by ignoring top priority matters. Overcome procrastination now. Don't let procrastination stop you from being a Philadelphia Christian. At the end time, most Christians are going to be Laodicean. As far as acting now, I want to go to Zephaniah chapter 2 and read the first three verses. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be, you may be hidden the day of the Lord's anger. Those who take proper action now, before it's time to flee, are subject to being protected from the great tribulation. I know a lot of people say, oh, I'll just know. Well, God's word warns you not to procrastinate and to gather together to support the true work, by the way. 
Yet, in the end time, most Christians will not be ready. They've got their various excuses. But getting back to that pocket article, let me read a sentence. All the crises, distractions, and temptations we face today have their analogs in the past. Now, you might think your situation is so different than anything anybody else has had. You're exempt, and God understands. Well, God understands that you're not always taking the actions He wants you to take. As far as it goes on in your life, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I realize many of us face what seems to be unique and often unbearable situations. But many of us, they're just different ones. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has given you today to take steps and to change. Now getting back to that pocket article. Create a sense of urgency. Stop letting yourself be distracted. That is not allowed. Instead, as if you were dying right now, stop allowing your mind to be a slave, to be jerked about by selfish impulses, to kick against fate and the present, and to mistrust the future. Marcus Aurelius, so you see that comes from thousands of years ago, that quote. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 31, we see kind of a similar concept here. I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Okay, we're, we're getting older every day. And yes, we die daily each day. We can't be certain of our personal future circumstances, but we do need to live each day in accordance with the will of God. If you will do these things, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and not rely on excuses and extraneous information and things getting in your way, you can overcome procrastination. Pray to God about it. So hopefully you have Philadelphia era of motivation. If so, you will work to overcome procrastination, support the work, become the type of Christian God wants you to be as you seek first the kingdom of God. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel.